Hello and welcome to the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh. Today, I am very excited for my guest, uh, someone that I've just studied and learned from for a long time now, several years. And one of the cool things about having a podcast that has some some power behind it is I, I'm able to actually reach out to these people I really admire and pick their brains about things. So I'm very excited about this. My guest today is a biologist, an expert on primates, a primatologist, uh, a psychology professor at Emory and an author, and it, his name is Franz De Waal. You've probably seen his work on the internet. Um, you might know who he is, you might not, but, um, but you've probably familiar with his work. I am really excited to have Franz De Waal here. Professor De Waal, thank you for, for being on the podcast. You're welcome. Okay, so getting right into it. Um, uh, perhaps the biggest podcaster, one of the biggest names in, in media right now is Joe Rogan. If you're familiar with Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan mm -hmm. podcast and all that kind of stuff. He's kind of just a regular guy, but he has his podcast, his platform that's really blown up. And he is the joke, the ongoing joke about the Joe Rogan podcast is that it's all about chimps. He has chimp noises in his introduction on YouTube and he talks about how, you know, chimps and all that kind of stuff for a long time. Uh, and I think what the connection is, is what his platform, the reason why his platform grew was because it's, a, it's really trying to just figure things out. He's a naturally curious guy. And I guess my question for you, someone who knows primates as well as anyone is, why do you, did you choose to study primates in the social sciences? Um, not just, I guess not just social science, but in science in general. Do primates tell us things about ourselves? Because there's so much variation in human beings that social science is, can get really tricky. You know, why is it that you chose to study primates as a way to better understand human beings? Well, my, my own motivation is just to understand the primates. Okay. So, so I'm not necessarily interested in humans, even though in my popular books, of course, I make yeah. all the comparisons with humans. But my first interest is understanding animals and understanding the primates. Uh, since chimps and bonobos that I work with are our closest relatives, it's very logical to make that connection uh, because not only are we the closest relatives of them, they are the closest relatives of us. And so uh, it's really um, very tight. They're about as close to us as let's say Asian and African elephants are to each other. You know, we call them both elephants. And so basically we should call humans and apes, both apes, I think. So that's how close they are. So my interest is that the social sciences, I think they need this kind of comparison because it's very hard to study your own species. They are stuck with their own species. They uh, cannot take distance. It's very difficult to take distance of your own species. You have all these ideological investments in behavior and moral investments. And you look at yourself all the time and how am I doing? And it's almost impossible. And that's why if you read a, a psychology textbook or an anthropology textbook, it's almost like an ideological track. It's like, how should humans behave? It's not so much about how do they behave, but how do we want them to behave? And I fortunately don't have that problem. So I just look at chimpanzees and whatever they do, uh, that's what they do. I'm not going to worry about how they should behave. That's not my goal. You know, I just want to know what they do and why they do it. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense when, when I... Um... So human beings are advanced primates though, right? Of course, we are primates. Yeah. When you look at like a crowd of people, do you see them as primates, as like advanced primates? Like, do you, do, you, do you think that you see human beings or a group of human beings differently than the average person who hasn't spent as much time as you studying primates? Oh, obviously, I, I, I'm a born observer. Yeah. And so all the details of body language and facial expressions, that's very important to me. Uh, language, I, I think, is actually less important to me. I don't particularly care what people say because I think the body reveals much more clearly what they intend and how they're going to behave next rather than what they tell you. They may tell you, uh, I'm so happy. 
but you know the the next week they're divorced or something it, yeah. I, I don't trust people at all no huh do you you trust primates more because they're less connected to those ideological kind of lines yeah i think primate behavior is very informative what what all the social scientists do at least the psychologists is they they present questionnaires to people and so they ask them how often do you have sex per week or something which which of course they're going to either inflate or deflate dependent yeah. on the circumstances so so you never get an honest answer and I just count how many times my animals have sex. And so uh, I think the information is more reliable. I don't understand, by the way, why psychologists, I, I've been for 25 years a faculty member in psychology. I don't understand why psychologists rely so much on spoken information or written information. Uh, I think they should go out there and watch people. That's probably gonna be much better information. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe it's like, is it like an ethical thing? Like, you know, if you would set up, you know, hidden cameras in someone's, you know, house or something like that, you get good data, but then there's the ethical issues where the, the primates don't have those ethical issues. They're not going to sue you for invasion of their no, privacy no. and putting it on the internet, right? No, of course, certain things like um, in the home and certain things are off limits, but, but for example, if you want to know about human power relationships, you do observations in the boardroom and, or in a company. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure you can do that in a way that is acceptable. Uh, so I think, um, uh, and there's so much human behavior going on out and about, not at the moment <laughs> because of the virus crisis, right. but uh, it's gonna happen again, you know? Yeah, is, does, the, does the virus affect, I should look this up, but like, does the virus affect primates? The virus very likely can, you know, everything that we get, the chimp can get. Uh, huh. So, for example, we give chimps flu shots in the fall yeah. uh, for the same reason, because they, uh, they get everything that we get. Yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the, um, the studies, and you have a, a TED talk on this that's really great, and I reference it a lot, is the concept of alpha male. And, um, and what... I think that, you know, just basically to give a quick synopsis of it is we have the wrong idea of what an alpha male is. We think of it as the big, strong person who's going to kind of push everyone around. And in a, a chimp troop, uh, the alpha male is the one, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the one who keeps the peace and provides comfort. Yeah, so um, the, yeah. people have the impression that the alpha male is a bully. And, and there's even business books that literally in the title they say how to push everyone around how to get the girl and they have all, all these ideas about alpha males um bullies do exist in chimpanzees there are sometimes males who are absolutely bullies and and unfortunately they sometimes end very poorly because the group at some point revolts against a bully um but most of the alpha males that i have known were more responsible characters they also worried about their position and the privileges going with it. I'm not saying that they are not um, taking the benefits from the position. Um, but they uh, keep the peace in the group. They interrupt fights between others, for example. They stand between the parties till they stop screaming, for example. They console others. They, they show more empathy than the usual male, uh, females in general show more empathy than males, but the alpha male is usually an exception, is a, is a male who comforts everyone. And so they, um, they create peace in the group. And if you remove an alpha male, we, we've done experiments not with chimps, but with monkeys, where we for one day remove the alpha male uh, in, a, in a large troop of monkeys, uh, the, the group basically falls apart. It, uh, right. it becomes very problematic. So the, the alpha male is an important character to keep the structure and the peaceful uh, situation of the group, partly because his presence prevents uh, extreme fights because he just steps in and stops the thing. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a wonderful template. The way I use it, just in my class, because I, I teach US history and government, and I talk about, you know, leadership throughout history and then, you know, our current situation in government. And the way I kind of promote it is we want a leader who will do those things because it's worked in, you know, in our, our evolutionary code. 
and we don't we want someone who is going to be strong enough you want the strong maybe even physically strong in in the terms of like you know more primitive societies or whatever like to be able to if there is a fight there's an in-group fight to be able to step in and have the strength to separate them and say stop causing chaos within the the, the tribe but also when there is hardship because suffering is inevitable in human beings in just you know in reality to be able to step in and provide comfort for those within their group that are struggling and suffering because we know that out of human suffering comes some of the most horrific kind of movements and atrocities in, in human history so that's kind of the way i promote it. we think that's accurate yeah the, f the physical strength is important up to a limit uh, mm -hmm. so the smallest male can actually be the alpha male if, if it, he has the in the if he has the yeah if he has oh. the right if he has the right support uh he he will have support of other males and and support of females so the alpha male the physical vigor is important but it's not all important people exaggerate that uh, because diplomatic skills are very important too and generosity is actually important we, we did experiments where we test the animals on how generous they are in sharing food with others and alpha individuals this is both for males and females alpha individuals tend to be more generous than others and so for me that raises the question did they get to their position because they were generous characters or do you become generous once you have reached that position uh, we don't know that yet so would you say that alphas what they do have in common is they're exceptional in some way like if you say like the the smallest chimp is actually the alpha is he um is he have like better is he smarter for lack of a better term is he have is he exceptional in some sort of inter chimp way does he see patterns and things like that that the other ones don't yeah i think uh, for a small male to be high ranking he needs supporters and so you need to keep the supporters happy so that all takes skills is that you need to groom uh, your buddy who is your supporter you need to share females with him you need to share food with him you, you need to be gentle with the females because otherwise the females are not supporting you and so an alpha male who is um, not so uh, physically strong as the others need other skills he needs social skills to get there and alpha males who are bullies who sometimes get there just by physical prowess um, they um, they are resisted and so they they may be alpha male for a while but then the group is almost like waiting for a challenger and if as soon as that male is challenged by somebody else they're going to put their weight behind it's almost like a democratic process they mm -hmm. they they don't support the incumbent they they support um, the challenger yeah um so getting into something and i don't this is where you said like people like human beings connect this to themselves and their own ideological kind of um anchors to understand the world but we keep saying alpha male or are there could uh, could there be a matriarchy in chimps? Is there a, a, a chimp ch troop where the the females are the ones doing that? Okay, so we have two close relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. Mm -hmm. They're equally close to us genetically. Mm -hmm. In chimpanzees, the males rule, and so the alpha male is the top individual. But the chimps also have an alpha female. The females always have their own hierarchy and they have an alpha female too. Mm -hmm. uh, in bonobos, it's the other way around. The females rule collectively. It, it, individually, a female bonobo cannot dominate the males, but collectively the females dominate and there's an alpha female. Uh, and they also have an alpha male, of course. So, so uh, hierarchies are usually separated by, by gender. Uh, I think in humans, that's probably also the case is that uh, males worry about their position among the males females worry about their position among the females and so you have these two separate hierarchies and each one has an alpha so chimpanzees for example even though they're male dominated the alpha female is a very important character because the alpha female dominates all the female and uh, so in my last book uh, which is called mama's last hug is about a alpha female named mama who was very much a mediator in the group. So, so she did not do the, the heavy duty stuff of breaking up a fight physically mm -hmm. uh, because that was more a male job. 
But she would, after fights, she would bring the parties together. She would arrange reconciliations between the parties. And so she played a very important and very central role. And since her position was much more stable than by the males, the males would change every four or five years in their positions. Uh, Mama was for 40 years, she was the alpha female. So it's a very central and very important position. Yeah, yes, absolutely. But there were still gender roles. And, and this is where, and I, I, you know, I have to go ask you these questions, even though it could get, you know, into some sort of like, quote unquote, trouble. But I don't think it, I don't think it should. We're talking about chimps here, but we're trying to understand ourselves. And, and um, when we're looking at gender roles, the gender roles are very important for stability. Now that's not to say that human beings aren't, we aren't, we're not chimps. And there might be some ways to, to play with those gender roles. And we've seen that and, and that's fine. That's not, I'm not saying anything moral, morality about that. So my little disclaimer, but there are clear gender roles. Do chimps inherently know those roles or do they ever try? Do you see females try to get into the male hierarchy or males try to get in the female hierarchy? No, the, the, um, there's no reason for a female to try to be dominant among the dominant males for chimps or uh, because the, the, the competition is very different. Males compete yeah. usually over access to females. So, so it's sexual, so sexual competition. And females usually compete over food because for females, how many offspring you raise, which is really the important characteristic for evolution. Uh, yeah. How many offspring you get and you raise depends on how much access to food you have and, and good quality food. And so the, the spheres of competition are different. Um, for a female to compete with males over sexual access would, would be nonsense. That, that would have no, no function. So, so I think um, that's also why the hierarchies are, are different. Um, yeah, the roles, the, the gender roles are different in the sense that females are much more offspring oriented than the males. So, so females have a baby on them or with them or a dependent offspring. And that's the main concern. And actually, if you want to make a female angry, that's if you, if you touch the offspring, that's where you, you get them angry. Yeah. And, uh, and for males, it's different. For males, it's, it's, doubting their status, so to speak, or challenging them. That's, that's what gets them angry. And so then, there are these different spheres in the group, uh, but I think there is quite a bit more flexibility in the, in the sex roles uh, than people imagine. People always imagine that in the primates, a male owns the females and he's the boss over the females. That's really not, um, that's based on an old baboon study from a hundred years ago, yeah. where indeed males are sometimes owners of females, you could say. Um, but in our close relatives, that's not really how it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And, and as we have evolved and now we're in modern, you know, modern, the modern world as human beings, the fight to survive just basic survival is not what it is for chimps. You know, the way chimps are programmed, the way chimps are in the wild, the way human beings were in the quote unquote wild is you needed to have these very clear roles and ways to do things. It's the way we've evolved, it's the genetics we're riding because that was the only way we could survive. Now, there's a lot of cushions on things and we have running water at just a turn of a knob and things like that. So where our, our, our genetics and our, you know, our lineage that's more closely to where these chimps are is, is, is some of the, the, the kind of the hierarchies and the way that we're programmed isn't as maybe important, but we still should, should focus on that because it helps us understand what we're doing and why we're doing. It's, it's a weird mix. Do you, know, yeah, do you understand so, what I'm saying? Yeah, so for example, um, it is for sure that in human society, uh, physical abilities matter less. I think uh, if you walk into a business, you, you're not going to walk up to the biggest guy assuming that that's the boss. That's, uh, he could be the boss, but he doesn't need to be the boss. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and so we, we have reduced the importance of physical presence and physical abilities, but we still pay attention to them. It's, for example, well known that 
during uh, American presidential elections, the taller candidates, male candidates, they have an advantage. And people have done studies on that, uh, looking, at, for example, presenting human subjects with pictures of a tall man and a short man, uh, and asking who, who, who looks most like a leader. And we go for tall, for the men. For the women, we don't care about that. So it's interesting that we have that difference is for the men we care, are they sturdy looking? For the women, we don't particularly care about that. And so we still have this leftover of a time where physical abilities were t tremendously important. And they still play a role in, so for example, Berlusconi and Sarkozy in France, Berlusconi in Italy, they were short leaders. They, they would travel with a box, and as soon as a picture was taken of them with other people, they would be standing on their box because they wanted to look taller than the rest. So, so we're still very sensitive to this. Well, that's why, I, that's why this stuff fascinates me. And I've just, I've read a lot of your stuff and I've watched like everything. And like, I think that it just helps me to understand when I'm studying history and, and trying to help my students to understand society. I, I just, it's important to recognize that. Now you might say like, we look at men to be tall, women, it doesn't matter, but maybe women like having that hourglass figure or something like, oh, wide hips, you might be able to carry a baby on that hip. Like that kind of stuff is in there, whether you recognize it or not, it's in there somewhere. And it's probably good to understand us by looking at our closest relatives, which is obviously what you do. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another really cool study that um, is, is probably what people have seen on like YouTube and stuff is a study about equal pay, which yeah. is Yeah, we did yeah. a study, uh, that's a, an experiment we did with capuchin monkeys. They're very small, they're the size of a cat, small monkeys. And so we had this study where, and you can look it up, if you look at fairness and monkeys, you will find the video on, on the internet. We would reward one monkey with very good rewards like grapes, and the other one with poor rewards like pieces of cucumber. And if, if they both get cucumber, both monkeys are perfectly fine with the whole setup and they do their task many times in a row. But if one of them is getting grapes and the one who gets the cucumber uh, gets pissed off basically and, yeah. and doesn't want to do it anymore. And so we do that experiment to show that monkeys are sensitive to reward distribution. Uh, and we think it's the same sensitivity that we have in our societies. And so if we worry and now, nowadays we worry quite a bit about an equal income, um, that is partly because we have that same sensitivity and uh, it undermines, unequal income undermines uh, cooperation. You, you don't want to cooperate with someone who takes everything. Let's say yeah. the two of us, we go hunting regularly and you take everything and I only get a few scraps. Uh, that's not a good arrangement for me. I need to protest against that or I need to find a different buddy. Um, so we are sensitive to that. And if the reward distribution is unequal, uh, we should object to that. Yeah, and it's why we object to it. You know, I think it was Naval Ravikant was talking about how, um, I might be wrong, but I think it might have been him, was talking about how in modern society, we look at Jeff Bezos or someone like that, and we say, you know, he has a private jet, and he has a Rolls Royce, and he has a mansion. But you, I mean, if you look historically, the average American is far more well off than, you know, the richest person 200 years ago, just because of air conditioning and running water and all that kind of stuff. But we still have that in us. Like the, in the study, the monkeys were fine getting a cucumber. It's like, woohoo, a cucumber. But then when you look, you go, wait a second, they're getting grapes and they're doing the same thing I'm doing. This is, yeah. this is bullshit. No, and they throw it out and they're like, no. And I think that we have that in us where even though we are fine with what we have and if you change the context a little bit there's always that kind of levels where someone who is doing really hard work they're working doubles at a diner or something for minimum wage they look at you in your cubicle just typing away doing data entry and you're making more money than them then they say okay well that's bullshit so we always have this like way that we're looking at un unequal distribution of resources oh you have yeah. grapes yeah, if you have yeah. grapes i should get some grapes what's going on because there are private jets so yeah, I it's, think it's, it's, yeah. it's always relative. So, so economists yeah. have, they know for a long time that if, if you live in a neighborhood where the houses are, let's say, $100,000, uh, 
and you have a, a $200,000 house, you feel very good in that neighborhood. Um, but if you uh, live in a $200,000 house in a neighborhood where all the houses are $400,000, you may feel very poorly in that house. And so it's always relative. And we have that same sensitivity as the monkeys. In chimpanzees, by the way, the chimpanzees are not monkeys. Chimpanzees are apes and, and have larger brains. In chimpanzees, we found that they also worry about getting too much. So if you, if you give a chimpanzee, two chimpanzees, a grape and a cucumber, the one who gets the grape is also upset and wants to share uh, with the other one. And so the chimpanzees have that tendency that humans, some humans at least, have, uh, that they want to share with the other and equalize the outcomes. Well, that gets me, that's a great um, you know, transition into what I wanted to talk about. Also, you've studied empathy a lot mm -hmm. and that's a perfect example is that is also in us that to be aware of the s suffering or the struggles or the unequal re resource distribution of the others my question for you is um and i didn't see this and i might have missed it but but i'm i'm, I'm curious when we talk about empathy is it empathy within their own troop or is empathy for all living beings, other chimpanzees, things like that? Empathy is always biased, socially biased. Mm -hmm. So you have more empathy also for humans. This applies to humans as well. You have more empathy for individuals who are similar and familiar. So uh, similar gender, age, race, language, uh, and familiar. So you have more empathy for individuals who are close to you, your family members, your friends. Mm -hmm. And so empathy is always biased. And, and there's now studies of empathy in rodents, <laughs> in dogs, in all sorts of mammals, because empathy is a mammalian characteristic. And in these animal studies too, we find that empathy is not some sort of universal trait, even though it can, it can expand. So, so interestingly, we, we can have empathy with other species, for example. So you can have empathy for your dog. Uh, hum, humans will, for example, rescue a stranded whale. Well, why would we? That, that's an empathy act. So we do have empathy for other species up to a limit, because we could also eat other species. Mm -hmm. And so it, we have that up to a limit. Um, but or, the original forms of empathy are always biased, are socially biased. Do you see the empathy that is displayed in chimps as a moral thing or is it a, a way to keep the balance thing? Well, it, it, it has moral implications because I think human morality would not exist if we had no empathy. If, if you were uninterested in anybody else, you're only interested in yourself. You, you don't look at the situation of others and you don't care about the situation of others. I don't see that you can be a moral being. So I think I agree with the Dalai Lama who says that compassion, which is a derivative of empathy, that compassion is the core of human morality. And so since chimpanzees have empathy and uh, to a high degree, certainly with individuals that are close to them, they are potentially also moral beings. And so human morality for me is not some sort of brand new characteristic. It's something that came out of these social tendencies of the primates. Yeah, because I see, I do a lot of stuff in like political science and look at the, the mess that is American politics. And it's interesting because the left and the right say that the, the other one is, they're not empathetic. That, you know, where's your empathy? But it's like, but they, again, only have empathy for the ones that are similar and familiar to them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I always am trying to help them to, you know, my students or people I talk to on social media or whatever, to like see, it's not that they're, they don't have empathy. It's just that it's focused differently than yours. Yeah, yeah. The, the human empathy has its limitations. But, but you know, we have... Uh, with our intellectual capacities, we are able to expand it. So, so for example, the Geneva Conventions, where, where they ask you to respect your enemies and, and that enemies have rights too. 
that's such a human concept. I don't think chimpanzees have that concept. Chimpanzees just kill their enemies. Uh, and, and humans have done that for ages, of course. Uh, so it's, it's not like we are innocent. But um, to, to think that your enemies may have rights, that's a very intellectual achievement, mm -hmm. a very important one. And I think when we try to expand empathy to those who don't look like us or those who don't talk like us, uh, that's a very important step. Uh, in, in human society. Yeah, well, but it's in a way, isn't our consciousness, I'm trying to think how to put this, like hacking our genetics? Like our genetics are saying, if they're a threat to me, my family, my, I'm, I need to kill them. But then our consciousness goes, wait, wait a second. No, that's not good. That's not, that's not good balance because if I do that, then things could rise up and then it could end up being bad for my family. Like even if you are, if, centrally you know um egocentric then you could still make decisions hurting others that will will affect you you don't get that balance i like how do we that do you see it that way that like our consciousness and the, how aware human beings are and the way our brains are developing is is in conflict with our genetics a lot yeah so uh, i'm not sure we'd call it genetics but we have hmm. We have motivations that are much more ancient, so to speak, and that keep, uh, keep impelling us to certain behavior and we can override that. Now you see some of that, of course, also in other animals. It's like, for example, self-control. People always think that animals run after their emotions and their instincts and they have no self-control. But um, you know the famous marshmallow test probably mm -hmm. that yes. they do with children. You, you, you give a child a marshmallow, you say you can get a second one if you wait long enough. Well, that test can be done with apes too, and we've done that. And they, uh, they will wait also, just like, just like kids. They can wait 15 minutes if that's necessary. And so self-control, which is where your intellect overrides your emotion, so to speak, and tells you it is smarter to wait in this particular case, is something that animals can do too. And so um, this conflict between, let's say, rational decision-making and emotional decision-making, that sort of conflict uh, you can see in other animals and they have that same sort of capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you, one of the cool things, uh, my wife's pregnant now, we have two kids. We have a, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And my six-year-old's at the age now where he's figuring out the world a little bit. And my four-year-old is too. But one of the things I miss about little, little kids is their, like, bring a religious term, like sinless. Like they're just, they're, there's no immorality. They're just, they're, they're more primitive and it's beautiful because they're, they're so pure. Mm -hmm. Do you see um, primates or especially, um, let's say, let's say um, chimps as in that way? Do you see them as like pure or do you see them like, oh wait, that one's actually like an asshole. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I know chimps, young chimps are like you described, um, up to the age of four, uh, because chimpanzees are nursed till they're four years old. Mm -hmm. Up to that age, they can do anything they want. No one cares. They, they can jump on top of the alpha male. That's fine. No one's going to punish them. They, they're almost, almost never punished. Um, then after the age of four, uh, yeah, uh, the, the adults are going to put boundaries and certain things they cannot do anymore, and they will get punished for them. And they will learn very quickly. And, and I think that's maybe the, the stage your kids are in. They, yeah. they learn to inhibit certain behaviors and they learn that they cannot get away with this and cannot get away with that. And so they, they become deceptive maybe to, to, to do things that you don't even know about. Uh, so yeah, I think you see that same development. And adult chimpanzees are more like a human adults, I would say they, they can be very calculating and they can be deceptive and mm. they, can, they can present themselves this way to one friend and that way to another friend. They, they're capable of all these things. Uh, it, that's really interesting. Um, being in a troop is extremely important for chimpanzees. And I think there's a good argument, you know, um, uh, Yuval Harari's book, uh, you know, Sapiens and all that kind of stuff, like the importance of being in a group. What does isolate, uh, so what I'm getting at is, I think there's real dangers to isolating human beings. And we've seen a lot of very dangerous mass shooting and stuff like that. Kids, 
um, individuals who feel isolated. It's a concern I have with my students who are at home on Zoom and don't get the social interactions with school. Just being isolated affects kids in a lot of ways. I have a lot of kids with anxiety right now and depression and things like that. They're really struggling. And I, I connect to your work all the time professor, like all the time. And I wonder, how does isolation affect chimps? Oh, isolation is about the worst. That's why isolation is also one of our worst punishments in, in prison. You yes. Know? Yeah. So isolation is very bad. And we humans, we tend to underestimate the role of physical contact, the role of smell, um, the role of being close to others. Uh, so, uh, with the current, you know, for the longest time we have said we can do all this teaching at the university we, or school, we, we can do all of that digitally, we can do it over the internet, and now we are learning during this crisis that actually it doesn't replace real presence of a real teacher and real interaction uh, between teacher and student. And um, uh, let, me t let me tell you a funny story, I, I once was on an airplane uh, to Tokyo and I was sitting next to an American businessman and and uh, he was going there for just one meeting of uh, flying all the way to Tokyo and he said why are you doing that is that not a meeting you can do over the internet he said no no I want to smell the people I want to see them sweat when we make a proposal I, I want to see how they react even though I don't speak the language and so he he was a man very much in tune with body language and bodies and I think we have underestimated how important that is to us. And uh, all these kids that you say feel now isolated is because they don't see their friends, they don't see their teachers, they don't walk to school. Uh, all, all these things are important to us, uh, walking together, playing together, um, uh, punching each other and so on. Um, all these things are important. Um, but that's now, we're now deprived of that. And, so, and I think it's very worrisome. Uh, I think we humans are much more intensely social and bodily social than uh, ha has been assumed, you know? Yeah, and it looks like that's the trend. I mean, part of what let me tell you. Of, let me yeah. tell you another story. Please, we had, yeah. one time we had locked all our chimpanzees in a building uh, in separate cages. Um, because we, we were redoing the outdoor enclosure. So they had a very large grassy enclosure with a big climbing frame and we were rebuilding the frame and it took a week. And so they were locked up for a week and we, we made this beautiful construction. And then we released all the chimps, 25 of them. And our assumption was that they would run into that structure and be so excited that we had built this thing for them and so on. So we were very focused on our work basically. But when we opened the doors, the first thing that happened for an hour or so is all these chimps standing around and slapping each other's backs and, and hooting and being so excited to see each other again. They were much more excited by each other than by that stupid climbing frame that we had built. And only after that did they start to explore that thing. And that taught me that for them, social relationships and physical connection was so much more important than how high you can climb, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it seems like this is a trend that's because of the lockdowns and everything like that. I think there are a lot of businesses that go, you know what? We don't need these cubicles. We don't need this office space. Have people just work at home. And I'm always like, oh, well, hold on, hold on. I don't, I don't know. We're, this is going really fast. You know, like the, the um, technology is amazing. It's cool. I can have this conversation with you, but I, it would probably be better over coffee. Like, mm -hmm. like and, and the more that we separate and the more that we put up these, these computer screens, these screens, we're, we're getting further and further away from something that, as you say, is really, really important. But we, we've also noticed that in social relationships, if you want to apologize to your wife about something you did, you can do that with a text message, but you know that that's going to be misinterpreted. That's, that, that's not going to no, work. My wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to do that in person. They have to see yeah. you and see if you're sincere. That's an important part of it, you know? And so uh, I think we have, we have overestimated what we can do with digital media. Yeah. I, I think so too. I'm with you on that. And it's a concern. Um, I'm glad we're talking about that.
Um, one, one more thing I just want to touch on is uh, the education system. That's kind of my lane. Okay, I get out of my lane a lot. <laughs> Sometimes it gets me in trouble, but, uh, but my lane is the education system. And I think there's a lot of problems with it, the way that it's done and structured and where the incentives are and things like that. Um, what, would, what would you, do you have any advice on, on like what you've learned from our closest relatives in the animal kingdom about what school should be structured like? Is it more social interaction? Is it more playtime? Is it things like that? Do you have any opinions on that? No, I, I, no. you know, I'm not an educator. I think playtime is important and independence of kids is important. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm from a generation and in my country at the time in the Netherlands, kids were not supervised at all. I, I did whatever I wanted to do without anyone running after me. No, my mom never knew where I was. I did, I did my own stuff. Yeah. And so I think kids need to have that sense of independence and connection with their friends. And uh, physical exercise, I think especially for boys, I think boys have a higher energy level than girls and, and need to run around. But I think it's probably true for both genders is you need a lot of time where they can just run around and scream and yell what they do. It, it looks maybe stupid to us, um, but that's a very important part of their socialization, I think. Yeah, I've had some awesome conversations with Lenora Skenazy, who's a free range kids um, woman, and you know, just talking about that, letting kids go out and kind of get skinned knees and all that kind of stuff. But the trend again is going to helicopter parents or bulldozer parents, helicopter parents kind of hovering everything over everything their kid does, or bulldozer parents who are just getting rid of all of the opposition and rounding the edges on everything so that their kid never falls over and gets a even yes, a metaphorical yeah, scrape knee. Yeah, so look at sports, for example. I, mm -hmm. I used to play as a kid soccer, mm -hmm. and, and this was all organized among us. It was mostly boys, but there were so, always sometimes girls in there. And so we would just line up uh, two teams and we would start playing. There was no adult present. So if there was a conflict about the rules, we would have to solve that ourselves. And we always did. There was, was never really a problem. Uh, but nowadays you have the, the parents standing there and encouraging the players and telling them what to do and all of that. I, I, I would have died if, if my parents would have been standing there telling me what to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so the independence of kids, I think, is very important. Yeah. Um, the uh, chimpanzees, I think it's important just to put out there, like as fascinating and amazing as, as they are, and you get to interact with them, you know, regularly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's a the very famous story of the woman who had one as, as like a pet, as like a companion, and it attacked her neighbor. And a re it's a really horrific story. Um, what do you, do you chalk that up as, you know, the chimp should not have been, you know, she would give it wine and Xanax. And, and it was a really, it sounds like really abusive to the animal and just playing with fire. Is that the way you saw, you saw that? Well, chimps are not pets. And I've never had a uh, primate, except for human primates, in my home. Uh, no, they, they, they don't make good pets and they, they become very dangerous and they become stronger than we are. So uh, even though they are smaller than we are, but they are physically much stronger than a, a human male. And so uh, you don't want to mess with the chimpanzee. And they usually, from all I have seen, they don't attack their owners, the, the, the people that they grow up with. They don't attack those. They attack others because they're jealous or they want to dominate them. Mm -hmm. And so that's the risky situation that you create. Uh, but you should actually never have a, a, a non-human primate as a pet at home. It's just a, a very bad idea. Even, even small monkeys, they have big teeth and they can bite. Um, um, they're not domesticated like dogs and cats are. Uh, which we basically bred to be in the home, uh, but yeah. we never did that with the primates. Yeah, that's just, people, I think people just like, are so like knee jerk. Oh, that's cool. Oh, look at that cute chimpanzee. It's so cute. He's wearing clothes and he, you know, does these performances and stuff well, like that. Well, if, like, if, if he's three year old, he is maybe cute. Yeah? yeah, even though at that time, even if he doesn't want to be dominated, you cannot dominate a three year old chimp. Hmm. But uh, when that chimp is 12 uh, and is fully grown, you cannot handle. And so these, these animals then usually end up in a cage in the basement. Uh, and the cage is usually very dirty because people cannot even go into the cage to clean it. 
Uh, and so uh, it's usually a very sad situation. Yeah. And then we at the zoos or the primate centers or the sanctuaries need to adopt these apes at some point to try to integrate them back with their own species, uh, which is very difficult because these apes have become half human and are used to watching TV or whatever they're used to. They're not used to uh, their, their fellow chimpanzees. And so it becomes very problematic. Wow. Yeah. So they, they adapt to like the American kind of lethargic lifestyle pretty quickly and they, they lose that <laughs> yeah. the stuff that keeps them, you know, kind of balanced. Uh, it must be fun to watch like Planet of the Apes with you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever well, seen I'm, the movies? I'm so glad that Planet of the Apes moved to uh, artificial, uh, what is it, animations? Yes. Oh. Because there was a time where the movies had entertainment chimps and orangutans in the movies, which was horrific. And, and these animals were always mistreated. And uh, because in order to keep them in line and do what they're supposed to do, you have to punish them. And so the trainers were terrible with them. And so I'm so glad we now have animations. And even though I must say there's a lot of violence in these Planet of the Apes movies that I don't agree with high levels of violence in movies, mm. um, but uh, I'm so glad they have animations instead of real chimps in there. Yeah, yeah. I would just be interesting to just pick your brain where you're probably like, oh, that's crazy, that's nonsense, what's going on? Like, like well, you just what, relax is, what, and is, take in the what is crazy about the Planet of the Apes movies is that um, there's almost no no females and and young ones present. It's all mm. it's all males. Yeah. Meals with weapons, basically. And yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah that, that, that is not really how I look at the chimpanzees, no. <laughs> oh, that's it. Ch chimps are pretty much 50-50. Like when, when they have a baby, it's a, it's a boy or girl 50-50. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. almost 50-50, so yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, I, I just thank you so much. It's, it's been really fun to pick your brain about this stuff. It really is it's so valuable to me and I'm gonna carry it with me into my classroom. And I hope that everyone listening um, learns something as well. Uh, can where can people like keep up with your work or or anything like that? Where where do you do you have a like a, a blog or do you post things or I anything a, like that? I have a Facebook site. It's called Franz de Waal Public Page. Okay, where I uh, it's like a three quarter of a million followers, where I put pictures and videos of animals. Uh, and sometimes I give an opinion if if something terrible happens, like the mm -hmm. escape of a gorilla or something mm -hmm. like that. No, but most of the time, it's more to show animal behavior. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Your your life's work has been extremely valuable to so many people. I just heard Jordan Pearson referencing it just the other day in a conversation. I mean, it's influenced a lot of people to help better understand humanity, help under better understand our place in society and how we can do it as well as possible. So it, it, it really is a significant contribution to to humanity. I really mean that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Good seeing you. Yeah, you yeah. too.